All right, everybody, it's five minutes after the hour, so we just want to be prompt and respect everybody's time. Um, I'm Ara Young at UNC Charlotte, and this is Sheila Rabin. Did I pronounce that right, Rabin? That's um, correct, you did. Good, yay. Um, her presentation is entitled Connecting the Dots with Persistent Identifiers for ETDs. Um, and Sheila is from Lyrasis. Is that how that's pronounced? Um, it's Lyrasis. Lyrasis. Okay, yeah. that does sound a lot prettier. Um, okay, so uh, the presentation is going to be about 15 minutes or so, and then there will be time for Q&A. Um, during the presentation part of this, just remember to keep your um, cameras and microphones muted. And then when we move to the Q&A, um, you can unmute to ask your question. Um, and then, you know, you could also uh, put comments in the chat if you want or questions in the Q&A. And if those appear there, um, I can feed those to Sheila. So take it away, Sheila. Perfect. Thank you. And thanks, everyone, for joining this session. Um, again, my name is Sheila Rabin. I'm the program leader for persistent identifier communities at Lyricis, and that includes the ORCID US community and the Lyricis Datasite US community. This session will provide an overview of how persistent identifiers, and in this case specifically ORCID and DOIs, um, can be used in ETD workflows to support fair scholarship and also gathering information needed to assess institutional impact with a focus on current trends as well as challenges and opportunities for adoption. Um, and I think some of you may already be using persistent identifiers and already familiar with these things and some may not be, but to make sure we're all starting on the same page, just a brief review about what persistent identifiers are or PIDs for short. So PIDs are basically unique labels or references that allow us to disambiguate people, places, and things in the research and scholarly landscape, regardless of changes over time, to help us track and gather information about research and scholarship and the entities that are involved. So for example, if we're looking for a specific person or author, we can use ORCID ID to uniquely identify the person that we're looking for to make sure it's the right person, even if there are multiple people with the same name or if the person's name has changed over time. And if we're trying to identify objects that were involved in research or maybe the research output itself, um, we can use DOIs or digital object identifiers to indicate precisely what object we're talking about. And if we're trying to identify where certain research took place or what organizations were involved, we can use the Research Organization Registry or ROAR ID to uniquely identi identify the institution in question. And these are just a few examples. But with these and other persistent identifiers, we can disambiguate people, places, and things regardless of language, naming, or changes over time. And the more we can use these PIDs across the research and scholarly landscape, the more we can answer questions about things like what organizations participated in the research, who was involved, how many publications came out of it, who's collaborating, and all of those kinds of questions. And by using multiple PIDs together, we can help to make research and scholarly content more fair. And that stands for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. So PIDs not only help to identify specific entities, and that helps with findability and accessibility, it, that also kind of, when things are more findable and accessible, they're more likely to be reused. So the graphic that you're seeing here is from an article that I have cited um, that talks about the interconnections of persistent identifiers and what we call a PID graph. Um, so you can see here that PIDs allow us to find the network connections between people, organizations, funders, um, publications, data sets, and software, for example. And if PIDs are used in ETD workflows, then ETDs can also be part of this ecosystem. And so for ETDs specifically, I'm going to focus on ORCID and DOIs. Um, many of you are probably already familiar with ORCID, uh, which stands for Open Researcher and Contributor Identifier. So again, ORCID IDs are you unique persistent identifiers for people, specifically people who are involved in research or other contributions. 
So anyone can get an ORCID ID for free. And the ORCID organization is a nonprofit, community-driven organization that serves the entire global community. And they manage the ORCID registry with support from organizational members ac across the globe. And so ORCID allows individuals to distinguish themselves from others, regardless of what their name is or changes in their name over time. And it allows them to keep all of their affiliations and activity information in one centralized place, similar to what you would see on a CV or a resume. Um, and ORCID also has an API or application programming interface that allows for transfer of data between an individual's ORCID record and local institutional systems. And I think many institutions are probably already collecting um, authors' ORCID IDs for ETDs. Um, if you're using the ProQuest ETD submission system, as an administrator, you can enable an ORCID field where students can manually enter their ORCID ID. And I'm also aware of the Vireo ETD submission system, which I believe works very similarly. People can enter their ORCID ID um, within those systems. But if you're using other systems or other workflows for collecting ETDs, I would love to hear about it. So feel free to put that in the chat, for example. Um, one thing to note, though, is that manual entry of an ORCID ID does leave room for potential error. So if somebody is typing in their ORCID ID and they accidentally get one number wrong, that's going to kind of defeat the purpose of having that unique number for that person. So the best practice is to make sure that you're getting the correct ORCID ID for each author. And that's to use basically the ORCID API to collect authenticated ORCID IDs, um, which you can do if your organization is a member of ORCID. Um, for example, University of Virginia has an ETD repository that has an ORCID API integration, so students can authorize University of Virginia to get their correct ORCID ID, as you're seeing here. And that way, they can make sure they have the right ORCID ID for each person. And also, ETDs can be added to the works section of a person's ORCID record, um, either by the individual entering that information themselves. Your organization can add that to their ORCID record using the API. Or if you're assigning DOIs to your ETDs, which we'll talk about more in just a minute, then your students can actually use the ORCID uh, search and link wizards to authorize either data site or crossref um, to add their, their ETD to their ORCID record for them automatically. Um, and we'll talk about DOIs, like I said, in just a minute. The image that you're seeing here is just a screenshot of my thesis from my ORCID record, and I entered it myself and um, that's, that appears on my ORCID record now. So in terms of benefits and challenges around ORCID, ORCID is beneficial because it serves as a shared standard for uniquely identifying individuals, and organizations can benefit from using ORCID to streamline collection of data about research and scholarly activities, as well as also assert information to people's ORCID records to confirm affiliations and other activities associated, associated with the institution. And all of this is designed to save time and reduce administrative burden by allowing information to be entered into ORCID once and then reused often wherever that information is needed. Some potential challenges for using ORCID are that each individual must take action. A central tenet of ORCID is that individuals have full control over their ORCID record and individuals have to register for their ORCID ID and make sure that they're using it. Um, so getting this message out to researchers can be a challenge to ORCID adoption. And also to get the most value of ORCID beyond ETDs, there really needs to be kind of a partnership and collaboration between multiple organizational stakeholders, such as you know the library, the research office, sponsored programs, central IT, and that can sometimes be a challenge at some organizations too. So besides ORCID, you might want to think about assigning DOIs to your ETDs if you're not already. Um, DOI stands for Digital Object Identifier, 
and it's usually expressed as a URI hosted at doi.org that corresponds to a metadata record about that object. So this example that you're seeing here um, is a DOI for a presentation about ORCID and Hein Online. And if this resource gets cited by others, but let's say the URL changes over time, the resource will still be accessible because it has a DOI and we're keeping that um, URL metadata up to date. So the idea is that it can always be found in the future and we can avoid people running into like a 404 page not found error um, by having this resource migrate on the web. So for DOIs, there are a few organizations known as DOI registration agencies that manage the logistics behind DOIs. So the two organizations that are most used in the US are Crossref and Datasite. Crossref most commonly supports DOIs for like journal publications, that kind of thing. And then Datasite is more geared toward um, research data, but also other types of resources that you would find in an institutional repository. So something like a, a thesis or a dissertation. And Crossref and Datasite are both supported by member organizations that want to assign DOIs to their local materials. So each member organization must submit metadata that corresponds to the item they're assigning a DOI to, including a URL that points to the landing page. So I've got kind of the metadata form for DOI here. So you would enter the URL. And then also something cool to note is that when you're entering creator metadata, you can actually use the person's ORCID ID to uniquely identify the creator rather than just their name. So that's one cool thing about ORCID and DOIs is that you can use ORCID IDs in your DOI metadata and DOIs can be found in ORCID metadata too. Um, in terms of the benefits and challenges with DOIs, they do provide a shared standard for permanent identification of content and objects. Um, and when DOIs are assigned to content, whether it's ETDs or some, something else, um, we can more easily manage those local assets, track usage of those assets through machine actionable disambiguous citations and ensure that the content is permanently accessible over time. Ultimately, again, saving time and reducing administrative burden. The biggest challenge when it comes to DOIs is making sure that the metadata related to the object, specifically the URL, um, is kept up to date over time as well as the persistence of the object itself. So DOIs are supposed to be reliable forever. So ensuring continuity and sustainability of that DOI metadata um, maintenance is really key. So as I mentioned, these, these PIDs work together. Um, they can each be included in the other's metadata. And that will help to link people and their ETDs or other objects together in a shared persistent way over time. And as I mentioned previously, if you are assigning DOIs to your ETDs, if you include the author's ORCID ID in your DOI metadata, and that author has connected their ORCID ID with either the Crossref or data site search and link wizard within ORCID, then that author's ETD can be automatically added to their ORCID record through either Crossref or data site. It depends on which registration agency you're using to assign the DOI. And aside from ORCID and DOIs, I want to also briefly mention ROAR, which stands for Research Organization Registry and is the relatively new and entirely open and community supported identifier for organizations. So if possible, you'll also want to use ROAR IDs in your ETD metadata to identify your institution. And ROAR IDs can be included in DOI metadata, and soon they will also be the primary organization identifier used in ORCID as well. So again, it's a good idea to use all of these persistent identifiers together so that the metadata is connected and discoverable. And the more persistent identifiers are used, the more we can see relationships and impact via these kind of PID graph connections. So you've got an ETD with the DOI there that's linked to the author, that's linked to the organization and so on. And you can see kind of all the connections between different resources, people and organizations. 
And this is a real life example of this PID graph that I'm talking about. Um, my colleagues in Australia um, did this and it's they looked at metadata from ORCID and DOIs to see what organizations and what countries were involved in coronavirus research. Um, and so the different colors represent different countries and we could drill down into this data even more to see the specifics of who was involved. So this is just one example of the possibilities that are there when we all use persistent identifiers. And if you're not involved in ORCID and you want to take advantage of the ORCID API, we do have a consortium for uh, institutions in the US that are ORCID members nonprofit organizations can join. It's called the ORCID US Community, and it was formed in 2018 as a partnership between uh, several library consortia that you're seeing here. Um, and right now we have over 150 members that are participating. So if you're interested in this, um, let me know. We also have a similar um, consortium for data site DOIs. So if you're not already using DOIs and you want to start doing that, let me know because we just started this consortium this year. Um, both of these are administered at Lyricis, um, and we'd love to you know, talk to you if you're interested in this. Um, and I think that leaves us some time for questions, but also definitely feel free to contact me. My email address is here, and also I had posted in the chat some links to materials from this session so you can have access to the slides. There's also a handout. Um, and that's it for me. Thank you so much for for your time. Thanks, Sheila. And thanks, thanks for um, going ahead and putting those um, materials in the chat for us. That's super helpful. There's a question there from Catherine Flynn. I don't know if Catherine wants to unmute herself and ask. Um, Or I can, um, let's see, Catherine says, can you compare the handle system with DOIs for the purpose of identifying ETDs? Is there a difference in perspective with respect to ORCID? Yeah, so um, with respect to ORCID, uh, you can use a handle and that's fine. The, the thing that makes a DOI different is that um, there are kind of more entities involved that are connecting to DOIs and also indexing the metadata behind the DOIs. So DOIs are generally more discoverable. Um, there are a whole bunch of different kind of external services um, that other kind of vendors or other companies run where they're actually indexing DOI metadata in their search services. So DOIs are a little bit more open in that way because all of the metadata behind the DOI is open. Whereas the handle is a persistent identifier, but it's not really linked into all these other identifiers. Um, you know, for example, behind a DOI, you can have your ROAR IDs linked, your ORCID IDs linked, and that's really what contributes to seeing these connections between entities. Um, whereas with the handle, you're not really getting those additional connections. Um, but DOIs are based on the handle system. So, you know, they are persistent identifiers. They're just not as connected with the broader landscape um, and not as discoverable as well. Um, so hopefully that answers your question, Kathy. Yes, very helpful, Sheila. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? And also, if anybody is already using ORCID and DOIs in your ETD workflows, I would love to hear from you. Um, it's because I'm always just interested in what people are doing. And um, the other thing is, if you're using some system other than like the ProQuest ETD or the um, Vireo ETD system, I would love to hear about that as well. And hopefully this session was helpful. Okay, great. Thanks, Roxanne. Yeah, I mean, any questions that you have about persistent identifiers in general, even just, you know, feel free to contact me. I'm happy to 
you know, provide more. This is just a brief snapshot kind of. Let's see, John, we deposit directly to our IR and then ProQuest harvest them from there. We have an ORCID field, but it isn't mandated that students create one yet. Yeah, I've heard a similar thing from other um, institutions where they give students the option to provide their ORCID ID, but it's not mandated. And I think that's fine. I think students are already kind of stressed out enough with the whole process of submitting their ETD and getting ready to graduate, giving them yet one more thing that they have to do. Um, I can see why you would want to avoid that. Um, but if they're willing to, if they have an ORCID ID and they will give it to you, then that's always a, a great thing to include. All right, well, it's 25 minutes past the hour, so time for us to wrap up and head to the next breakout session. So thank you so much, Sheila. Thanks, Sarah, and thanks everyone for attending. Bye, have a good day.